Okay, so hopefully you found that piece kind of interesting. And the idea that they were trying to convey is that um, during gestation, if you recall from our earlier discussion about the development of anatomy, um, there is a roller coaster basically of testosterone that occurs prenatally, generally in people who have a Y chromosome. And so those prenatal hormones, that bath of testosterone, um, early the early peak of testosterone affects the um, sex organs, the genitalia and the reproductive organs. The second burst of testosterone that occurs later in gestation, um, many researchers have been examining the function of that and they have come to the conclusion that it masculinizes certain structures in the brain. And so we're going to talk about which structures are most important for potentially governing sexual orientation in a second. But what I wanted to do is um, talk for a second about something that they brought up, which is the 2D, 4D ratio. So what you would want to do if you want to look at your own hand and determine what your 2D, 4D ratio is, um, is to actually use a ruler that um, starts at the base where you're where your pointer finger joins the palm of your hand, there's a crease there. So put one end of the ruler on that crease and then measure all the way to the tip of your index finger and not counting fingernails or anything like that. So it can be a little bit tricky to make sure that you're doing a good accurate uh, measure, but, but that's the process. You measure from the, from the crease where it joins the palm to the tip. And then you repeat that same process with the crease where the ring finger joins the palm all the way up to the tip of that ring finger. And then you measure, then you, um, you look to see which one of them is longer, if either. Um, on average, um, men typically will have a longer ring finger than index finger. And on average, women will have a longer index finger than ring finger. So that's just on average. Um, I would like to give you one caveat. You should measure your dominant hand, um, whichever hand you tend to prefer. If you're, if you are, strictly ambidextrous and you can use both hands equally well, um, then it probably doesn't matter which of your hands you measure. But if you have one hand that is dominant, measure that one. Um, because in my research on the 2D, 4D ratio, I've discovered that the um, associations between the lengths of the fingers, the ratio of the, of the pointer finger, which is your second digit, so it's called the 2D, and then your ring finger, which is your fourth digit, so that's called the 4D, um, I've found that the, it is your dominant hand that is the best predictor of, um, you know, the, that hand's ratio being tied to other things. Um, so in this case, what we're talking about is the possibility that um, having an inverted pattern. So if you are a woman and your hand is, um, is organized the way that the typical straight man would be organized, it's more likely that you're lesbian, but it is not a given. And the inverse is true for men. If you have a pattern that looks like the female pattern, then it, it's more commonly associated with gay men. But I would like to really stress, do not diagnose your sexual orientation as a function of your hands because it is not, it is not that clear um, for a couple of reasons. One reason is that, as I mentioned, a burst of testosterone early in gestation affects um, anatomical things right? So um, before the development of your genitalia came the development of your hands. So if there was testosterone present while your hands were developing, then you'll get a masculinized hand pattern. If it was absent, then you'll get a feminized hand pattern. But that presence of testosterone, that would be about five weeks after conception, is not necessarily going to be associated with, an, with another burst of testosterone around 24 weeks after conception, you know, another 19 weeks later. Um, so it's completely possible to have, let's say, a masculinized hand pattern in a woman, and she is completely heterosexual or, you know, a, a one or a two on the Kinsey scale, a zero, one or two on the Kinsey scale. Um, so don't, don't think, oh, no, I must not understand my own sexual orientation. My hand is telling me something different. Do not do that. Because um, there are these two bursts of testosterone that can masculinize the hands and then later could masculinize the brain. So it, this is just used as sort of a measure. It's not a, a diagnostic tool or a given. And those of you whose index fingers and ring fingers are exactly the same length are a really good test case of how, like, what are we supposed to do with that, right? It doesn't mean if you have 
um, an index finger and ring finger that are exactly the same length that you are neither male nor female or that you are exactly a three on the Kinsey scale. It doesn't mean anything like that. It just means that your fingers are the same length. Um, so don't put too much, don't put too much meaning on this. Um, my research on the 2D, 4D ratio has been looking at um, whether people who have masculinized hands express more masculine attitudes about sexual behaviors. And on average, they do. And so it's um, possible that there is this correlation between if you have a masculinized hand, you probably also have a masculinized brain. But I have to say, most of the people with the masculinized hands also had a Y chromosome and declared themselves to be men. So um, it's all kind of mixed up and hard to really pull apart, right? If the average XY carrying person has a masculinized hand and the ever average XX carrying person has a feminized hand, we're really only interested in sort of the unique few whose hands are orient, organized differently. So please just keep that, um, you know, in perspective. But what I wanted to talk about, though, is really how our brains might be different as a function of biology. Now, when we talk about brains being different, it could be that you're genetically set up to have your brain be organized differently, or it could be that your brain got um, affected by hormones during development, and that has caused you to have your brain organized the way that it is. So let's talk a little bit about what I mean. Okay, so in this first picture, the um, little green area that's highlighted there um, is called INAH. So that's, for those of you who care, um, interstitial nucleus, anterior hypothalamus. The hypothalamus has been mentioned a few times in this class as we've discussed its control over the endocrine system. It's the hypothalamus that sends out a message through the pituitary gland to you know, ripen eggs or to release more testosterone or those kinds of things. So the hypothalamus has been long known to be involved in the endocrine system. It's been long known to be involved in a lot of different kinds of motivational things. There's a particular area of the hypothalamus that makes you feel hungry. It makes you feel, there's another part that makes you feel full when you've eaten enough. Um, there's a part that makes you thirsty. Um, there is a part that makes you want sex at all. Um, and then this part helps to determine which sex you're uh, attracted to. So I'm going to zoom in a little bit and show you some actual slides um, where they've actually dissected that interstitial nucleus. Um, and they've focused in on just specifically a, a region called INAH3. So it's the third area of the interstitial nucleus of the anterior hypothalamus. And um, when they look at different species of animals, in this particular area of their hypothalamus, they find that on average, and it's true for humans too, all animals, on average, males will look more like the left, where you can see these um, black arrows that were put in to orient you to look at, that's what you should be looking at, is that cluster of, of black dots that's sort of contained within those four arrowheads. Um, so on average, males of a species will have a bigger, so see how like the area is larger than if you look on the right, that's the female. So the area is larger. And then you also see that there are more black dots in that area on the male on the left side. So on average, males of every species have shown a larger, more densely packed INAH3 than females of that same species. But what they have recently found is that among heterosexual males and then homosexual females, you see the masculine pattern within this area more commonly. And then among heterosexual females and homosexual males, you see the pattern on the right more commonly. Now, the original research on this question looked at the INAH of people who, who were deceased. I, I don't know exactly a nice way of saying corpses, so I was... <laughs> trying to say it in a nicer way, but people who um, donated their bodies to science. And so this part of the hypothalamus was donated to the research that was being conducted on this question. Um, and the original study consisted almost exclusively of men. Um, most of the bodies that had been donated to science were male. Um, now among the volunteer, I think there was one female in the sample and that was it. And so you can't really draw too much a conclusion from the original study about anything having to do with females. Um, so they were comparing like the male 
pattern to what we know a male pattern should look like or what we know a female pattern should look like in this particular study. Because in this study, what they were looking for is whether we saw differences in this INAH3 among the men who were known to be gay and the men who were known not to be. And what they found was this typical pattern where the, the heterosexual males had the larger area and the homosexual males had the smaller area. Well, this original study was pu published in 1993 by a man named Simon LeVay, who, um, you know, he was from um, UC San Diego. He was working for the Salk Institute. He had all sorts of credibility and status and everything else. But then he introduced this idea that it's possible that sexual orientation is a biological factor that's determined by a very, you know, a very basic part of the brain, you know, deep in the hypothalamus. And a lot of people didn't want to hear that. And so, um, you know, some of them attacked his methodology. They said, well, you didn't really know these people. You couldn't ask them any questions. So how do you know for sure that they were gay or straight? How do you really know whether they ever engaged in gay behavior or, or not? Or if they'd ever engaged in straight behavior or not? You know, like you don't really know anything about them. So you can't really draw any inferences about them. Um, and attacking the methodology is kind of a fair thing to do in science, right? It's a perfectly fine thing to say, well, we're, I don't know if I can trust your results because we don't really know how you did it or, or maybe you did it in a, a, a you know, less than advantageous way. But then there were a lot of attacks that were what we call ad hominem attacks. They were attacking him as a person. So people said that because he was gay, he, want, he was just desperate to prove that it's biologically based, that it, you know he was just willing to falsify data or whatever it would take to prove that it was um, biologically based. Other people said that because he was gay, he was unwilling to see evidence that it was a choice rather than a predestiny, that they, you know, things like that. So they attacked him personally. And it's really unfortunate that we bogged down for a little while you know, attacking him rather than, you know, other people just replicating the data. But the good news is um, more technology has come along that has allowed researchers to look at this question without having to actually dissect people's brains, right? In the interim, it has become more affordable and more possible for people to do research using um, MRIs. MRIs back in 1993 were completely cost prohibitive and psychologists usually didn't have access to those kinds of things. Even a researcher at Salk Institute, he probably didn't even know how to run one. Um, so other researchers have used uh, MRIs and living people who then they could ask questions about their behaviors and how long they've known about their sexual orientation, whether it's um, heterosexual, homosexual, bisexual. Um, they could include males and females on purpose to make sure that everybody was included. And thanks to all of these follow-ups and these replications, um, I would like to argue that Simon LeVay has been vindicated that it wasn't just him trying to be biased because everybody's research has supported his initial finding, which is that on average, a larger INAH3 area is associated with being attracted to women and a smaller one is associated with being attracted to men on average. So, you know, don't go get your functional MRI and diagnose your sexual orientation that way either. But on average, what we see is that the size of the INAH3 area seems to correlate very strongly with um, sexual orientation. Okay, so the brain may determine our sexual orientation. Now, one thing um, I wanted to make one more comment about Simon LeVay that people correctly pointed out is that um, our brains are plastic, which means that um, based on our experience in the world, our brains actually adapt and mold themselves to actually represent what we've experienced in life. Um, so for example, those of us who have been ra raised in a Western world with lots of carpentered buildings with, you know, good straight verticals and really good straight horizontals, we literally have more neurons in our brains devoted to processing vertical and horizontal lines than we have for processing diagonal lines. If you go to other parts of the world where you have hunter-gatherer societies that, for example, Australian Aborigines have been studied, and they have equal numbers of vertical, horizontal, and diagonal um, detectors, because in their native environment, they see equal numbers of verticals, horizontals, and diagonals. Literally, our brain takes on the shape of whatever we have experienced and whatever the environment demands. And so one thing that's a little bit hard to know for sure with regard to the argument that a brain structure can d drive our behavior is did our brain structure take this form 
and then drive our behaviors? Or did our behaviors shape our brains into this form? And that's a really hard one to parse out. Um, you can't really do MRIs on babies very well. And so, and then wait 20 years to find out. It's very difficult. Um, but it's a, that is a legitimate complaint about this kind of research. We don't know what comes first, the brain structure or the behavior. And so we really have to keep that in mind. Okay, so let's take a break here. And in the next segment, I'll pick up with the idea that maybe genes determine our sexual orientation.